Hello, and welcome again to the Goddess in Art. My name is Star Goody, and this program is dedicated to the power and creativity of the goddess. My guest for the show tonight is Rianne Eisler, lawyer, lecturer, futurist, internationally known scholar, and she's the co-director of the Center for Partnership Studies. And she has written several books, including The Chalice and the Blade. Welcome, Rianne. It's good to be here, Esther. Very honored to have you here. Well, thank you. Well, the first thing I wanted to ask you was your book. L let me, I want to show your book, too. This is, this is The Chalice and the Blade, and I want you to know my artwork is matching the <laughs> Sardinian <laughs> goddess that, that is, is on your cover. This book has caused quite a stir. You, since it's been published, it has uh, been reprinted ten times. Yes. It's being translated into six different languages. Right. You've been on national bestseller lists. I mean, the response, maybe it's just more than you ever even imagined. And I know that it took you over a decade of research and study to write the book, but yet the, the basic premise of the book is very simple, which is, of course, that there are two modes, two structures that society, human society can be based on. It can be either the chalice or the partnership mode, the life-affirming peaceful mode, egalitarian, or else the lethal power of the blade, the partnership, I mean, the, the dominator mode, which um, is what our current Western culture has been for the 5,000 years, this last 5,000 years up to now. And why do you think that your book has had such a response? Why do you think it's touched so many of us? Well, you know, it has been quite extraordinary. Mm. And I have been deluged with letters, with phone calls, and that's really how the Center for Partnership Studies mm. was born, out of that response. I think that there are a couple of reasons for it. I can judge, really, from my own response when I was doing the work. Uh -huh. Because a lot of it was simply an aha experience. Mm. It was like, oh, so that's what this meant. So that's what a serpent was doing, for example, <laughs> in the Garden of Eden. Uh, so we don't really have to live this way. You know, there uh -huh. is another possibility, which is the partnership model. I think that, you know, the book functions on a number of levels. On one level, it does give a whole new conceptual framework, and that clarifies a lot of things, and it certainly did for me, and it is doing that for really all of these people, both women and men, who are really responding. But I think there's still a deeper level. Mm -hmm. And the Chalice and the Blade tells a story, and it tells a far more interesting, far more accurate in terms of the newest scientific evidence and far more hopeful story of our human adventure here on Earth. And I think it's really reaching us on an archetypal level. Uh, getting in touch really with perhaps, uh, well, if Jung uh, and, and Freud were right, with our collective unconscious, with memories of this earlier time that have, as a matter of fact, and maybe we can talk about that, really been preserved in some of the most familiar stories that we have, because they give us clues to this earlier time, thousands and thousands of years, when, as you said, the life-affirming powers of the universe were the guiding principle. And these powers were seen as divine, as incarnated in the body of woman, and also the supreme powers that rule the universe were seen as a great goddess. See, it, it, it's really intriguing because, of course, the grand synthesis that you do does cut across everything and, and the simple thing that applies to everything, all cultures throughout time. And because the earlier partnership cultures were suppressed by uh, other dominator cultures or overlaid by them, and because, you know, some of this is 3,000 years ago, some of this is 40,000 years ago, and yet it does live on in us because it, it is in our roots, it is in our soul, it's in our cells, so to speak, so that we can respond to it. Like, it's so I think fascinating. It's this, it's this really return to roots. Mm -hmm. that ha accounts, I think, for the tremendous sort of visceral response and the tremendous sense of empowerment that so many people, particularly women, yeah. are feeling you know, from this book. And I certainly felt it as I was working on it. And it is so very interesting because it challenges, of course, all of the conventional stories. Right. <laughs> that we've, and the conventional stories have a function in a dominator society because if we're told really that there is no other alternative, that it's divinely decreed that we have this miserable way of living, yes. war, war of the sexes, you know, the whole thing, and they're suffering, they're related. suffering. That's right. Then, then you can't, you may think it's a good idea, but if you don't think it's possible, then you can't yes. move. And this is the empowering part, the knowledge. And I don't think it's accidental that we're reclaiming this new information about our really hidden past, our hidden partnership heritage of these thousands and thousands of years now because, well, 
uh, the title of the book is The Chalice and the Blade, and we live in an age when the blade is the nuclear bomb, exactly. when one more war could be our last. And we really have this survival thrust of our species trying to really reconnect with these earlier partnership roots. The thing that, one of the things that's intriguing to me is, um, of course, reading your book, it's a pretty dismal story, some of the atrocities in the past, but, but the, you have a foundation of hope, and the foundation of hope from which the, the hope rises, the foundation is the fact that there was these partnership studies, I mean these partnership cultures, these partnership cultures that reach back into the Paleolithic that are so ancient and that continued for thousands of years, some of them tens of thousands of years, and yet, until recently, nobody knew about them. So, what's the cover-up here? I mean, is well, this Goddess Gate or something? <laughs> what's I the think it is. Here? I love it, Goddess <laughs> Gate. That's a wonderful way of putting it. Well, the way that I talked about it in the Chalice and the Blade is really as the greatest cover-up. Yeah. And, well, you see, look, we do live by stories. We live by yeah. images. I mean, you talk about goddess art, and the resurgence of this art is tremendously important because it is out of stories and out of images that we create for ourselves the models of what we consider to be reality. Exactly. Now, the remissing, there are two chapters in The Chalice and the Blade called Reality Stood on Its Head. Yeah. And it really describes this process when literally reality was stood on its head, when we were told, basically, to accept the idea that woman is not creative, you know, that, that we're created, for example, by a male god and who whips woman out of just a male rib yet. I mean, adding, and then, of course, she's to blame for everything, you know, exactly. that ever humanity. That really is standing <laughs> the old reality totally on its head. When woman was seen as creative, as life-giving, as life-sustaining, also, you know, I mean, she also had the darker side, you know, the goddess, because she took us back into her womb at death, but we were from there to be reborn, like the cycles of vegetation. And uh, it's, it's not only the, um, it's the archaeologists too. I mean, it's the scientists, as you say, the art like holds our view of reality in place. So when these archaeologists are interpreting this other data, they're, they're really wrong. And I'd like to get into the first set of slides that you brought, because you show us how wrong archaeologists yes. can be. So let's take a look at the first art that you brought. Okay. All right, so maybe you can explain this. We can see this is a bone engraving. Yes, well, you can barely, you can barely see it on that slide. Yeah. I, I wish they'd go to the next slide, which actually shows a line drawing. It, it'll be fine it. for the audience. Okay, great. Well, look, what, uh, of course, happens if you have a certain paradigm, you know, a certain worldview, mm -hmm. is you interpret the data that you get in terms of that model. And the model for studying history, uh, archaeology, of course, being part of that, has been literally the study of man, and very specifically that our prehistory was the story of man the hunter and man the warrior. So, so now, we, now we see this is the drawing of the, the, the slide that we just saw before, yes. and so we see these little, uh, they, think, they thought they were they arrows. They thought that these were wrong way arrows, and what they couldn't figure out were why these people would have wrong way arrows, and also why they'd be constantly missing their mark. Well, what we know now, of course, once we get away from that model, is that they weren't wrong way weapons, they were really line drawings of vegetation with the branches going exactly the right way. <laughs> right. And I think the second slide that you saw uh, after the wrong way arrows slide was what they used to call the Venus figurines. Yes. And they interpreted these as either something to do with a rather obscene fertility cult or okay. as sort of the modern counterpart I mean, the ancient counterpart of our Playboy centerfolds. Right, these are just uh, unregenerate male fantasies. <laughs> that's that's what right. one, one archaeologist yeah. called them. Well, and then they couldn't figure out why these people would have some very bizarre, these very bizarre notions, these rather distorted notions of what is erotic. Yes. Well, clearly, these were precursors of the great mother goddesses of, that we even find still in historic times, you know, in, in, in Greece and in Rome, you know, uh, and they are. Uh, very much oval in shape. Yes. It's like a cosmic egg. It's really very much like the figure behind us, which yes. is a wonderful <laughs> figure, you know, a wonderful modern piece of art. Uh, but again, it was the wrong model. It was the wrong way of interpreting. These figures really were images of the life-sustaining and life-giving powers of the world. And yes, incarnated in the body of woman, because the most, if you, if you imagine the dawn of human consciousness, the first thing must have been the consciousness of that miracle that life emerges from the body of woman. Exactly. I mean, we see this, this 
this this goddess really from Chatelhuyuk sitting on her leopard throne and we, we she really looks like she's ruling the world here in a in, in, in a totality and in a cyclical way and we, we can't see but she's giving birth and we feel her weight. She's really like the center of things. She is the center of things. And by the way, something very interesting. I really started to look at that figure. Do you know that one of the figures is a leopard but the other one is a sheep? Oh really? Yes. So it's a partnership of it's these a, things. It's a whole I mean and that, that iconography of course yeah. is very deeply rooted then because we hear about it later in, in in other religions like mm -hmm. Christianity. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, the goddess, Chatalhuyak goddess, look, the early goddess figurines that we saw from the Paleolithic were about 25,000 years BC. Yes. These are already about 6 and 5,000 BC. And there's a later one, the Sumerian goddess, holding again the trees, the tree of life and the tree yes. of knowledge. I, I think that's what we have uh, on now. Yes. That one uh, is even later. But you see the continuity of worship, and that has all been suppressed, and now it's really coming out. And it, of course, explains an awful lot of things. Uh, it explains a lot of things that don't make sense. Uh, and for me, writing this book, really, and doing the 10 years of intensive research for it, when I said there were a lot of aha experiences, uh -huh. well, one of the most wonderful things was that I finally understood, for example, what a snake was doing in the Garden of Eden story. Because that story really had clues to this earlier reality. Look, it told us, first of all, that there was a time when woman and man lived in harmony with one another and with nature. It told us it was in a garden, which are these first Neolithic agrarian societies, yes, the first ones exactly. that planted gardens. And it also told us when it was. It was before a male god supposedly decreed that woman be subservient to man. And when I was a kid, I remember I could never understand why uh, there would be a snake in the garden. And what I really couldn't understand is why women would take advice, seek advice, and then take advice from a serpent. Well, the serpent was one of the epiphanies of the goddess. It sheds and regrows its skin. It's a symbol of cyclic regeneration. But even beyond that, even in the, well, this survives even in historic times in the Oracle of Delphi, the snake, the serpent, was a symbol of oracular prophecy. And I, I think it's so interesting looking at that snake and the snake, we see it again and again in so much of the art and I mean even in, in the Christian art of course by that time the iconography of the snake is sort of debased and it's this evil creature whereas we know like you were just saying before it was a life affirming power, it was the power to regenerate, to, to come back again and it was a wisdom, the snake is snake. connected. That's right. And, and looking at this art piece that we have today, this by contemporary artist Charles Sherman, this, this is the cosmic egg of the goddess and it's based on on the earlier goddess mythology and I, I wanted to get to art because as you said before then in earlier cultures as now art has the power to transform a culture art has the power to maintain that's it right. because it can really it, it, through the artists um, and that's why when we look at these old pieces of art and in your book you said that um, it's really one of the greatest sources of information we have about the past is the art that our ancestors left us. And when we look at that, we can feel the story of that art. And, and in contemporary times, the art that we see now too, you know, I mean, it, 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 does, it can really affect us either way. Very definitely. And I think that the art, that very cynical art that we see so much from the East Coast, for example, yes. the deconstructionism, yes. is really, I mean, maybe it had its function in sort of taking apart, you know, the dominator system, the last shreds of, of how really miserable it is. But what we need to move into now is what artist Susie Gavlik calls reconstructionism, it, which is the art that can help us move towards the partnership society. This joy of the goddesses the joy, dancing. Yes. Precisely. And, and I don't think, again, that it's accidental that so many artists today are going back to these archetypal uh, partnership goddess images because they are empowering and they do give us a whole new model of reality. And one of the things that is very, very interesting to me uh, is when I was doing the work, you know, the research for the chalice and the blade, of course I focused a great deal on Minoan culture on the exactly. island of Crete. Yes. And one of the things that was so striking to me when I looked at the art of Crete is really how many of the themes in the art of Crete pre uh, are really prefigure some of the modern art that we're seeing today. Well, you call the art of Crete the, the most inspired art in the ancient world, and I'd like to take a look at the next bit of artwork that you brought, because let's, let's see that inspired work of Crete. Actually, I'm not the only one who called it that. Oh, really? Because it was a, all these scholars, they kept raving and raving about why is this art unique in the annals of civilization? Well, when we really look at Minoan civilization in the context of this larger picture of our history that the Chalice and the Blade yeah. provides, which is that our original direction was in the partnership direction, we see that Minoan civilization 
was the last known and most technologically advanced example of a society that orients primarily to the partnership rather than the dominator model of society. And I think that this, this seeing this Minoan snake goddess, we see her, we see the snake in a new way here, holding, holding the, you know, the snake in both her fists and the power of that. So we see the snake in a much more different way. Let's go on to see some of the other pieces that we brought. We have some fabulous frescoes. And now, these are the, the ibex, the two horned animals here, and we see such a love of these animals, such a feeling for them. And that very beautiful, almost lyrical, natural treatment of animals is really something that disappeared almost entirely in later art through the Middle Ages that only began to make its reappearance in full force almost in modern times, because even in the state-supported and church-supported art, the natural world was very much in the background. And yet here, it's, it's like modern art. It's right there in the foreground. Right, right. Or the world was just something to get through, right? That's to, right. So you can be in heaven later. Okay, now these, and these dolphins, and these, they're so beautiful. And, and now, again, in modern times, we've come to have such a feeling for them. And this is a fresco from the Queen's Chamber in the Minoan Palace. That is and correct. Creek. And you see, I mean, it could really be a modern ecology poster, yes, couldn't it? Could. That's one of the things that really hit me. I yes. thought, my goodness, I mean, you know, if you, if you didn't know where it came from, and I don't, again, I don't think it's accidental that the dolphin, which was so important in Minoan art, is again, because they're such interesting creatures, we really, I think the Minoans sensed our partnership, our kinship with these creatures. Uh, I don't think it's accidental that as we are today trying to move more towards a partnership society, that these symbols are again so popular. And uh, yeah, I, I think so too. And, and then looking at this piece of the, the boy, the fisherman, and, and again, not only, because partly what you're saying is it isn't men, it's the social system. Here we have an image of a man, and he's, you know, he's, there's a real beauty and grace to him. Well, this is why I brought these images, because, and I'm so glad you stressed this point, yes. because what I always try to stress is that what we're not talking about is an issue by any means of women against men or men against women. What we're talking about is an issue of social organization. Exactly. And we do know now that we have these two choices, that we can live in partnership. They're not ideal societies, partnership societies, but they're an awful, in memory, we remembered them as ideal, you know, the paradise legend, because yes. they were so much less tense, so much less violent, so much more peaceful. There wasn't the idealization of rape or of the heroic warrior, so, you know, this, this idea that of idealizing the hero as killer oh, is completely absent from, from well, this Well, here art. we have this idealization or just really representation, this plumed, feathered figure here. I mean, and, and there's, there's a lot of beauty and love and joy to this. It isn't, it's not stabbing something like... Well, that's I mean, precisely yes. it, and that's something very important, that today when so many men are searching for a different yeah. identity than the identification with the macho conquest, you yes. know, conquest of women, conquest of other men, nations, yeah. nature, that here we have some of the images that came out of that culture. And they're, they, again, it's part of what we're trying to reconnect with. Now, this is one of my favorite pieces. This is the bull leaping, the games that, that they play. We see, I think there's a woman leaping over the bull, and we see a man or a woman on either side. And well, it's very it's interesting fresco. because yeah. what, we, what we see is that both women and men were athletes. Uh -huh. uh, we also see that they worked very closely, really in partnership, and it was a partnership that you had to be very trusting, <laughs> very sure that you could rely on each other. Uh -huh. Of course, these were bulls that had been tamed, uh -huh. uh, that had been raised from babyhood, you know, like Ferdinand, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they still had the power, they still represented the daring, if you will, the adventure of going, you know, and really looking at, at the possibility of death but also at the possibility of this great power. So this was ritual dancing mm -hmm. that they really did. And uh, it's very hard for us to consider that, you know, going to church, for example, or it could be a joyful occasion, that it could be an occasion for a celebration and for a dance and for, you know, for this whole feeling of awe yeah. of life and yes. also of death, right. of both. And, of course, the belief in rebirth, in the cyclic nature of the world. Yes, rather than whipping ourselves for how bad or evil we are, or what sins we're committing here. And, and one of the things about Crete, too, is it was the flowering of the partnership culture, because after that uh, came a point where it was overrun. And, and this, for me, was one of the most illuminating parts of your book. It wasn't something I was familiar with, that you take up the systems theory, which is, again, 
something that offers a lot of hope, how social systems can exist in equilibrium for a long time, and then something from outside of it that it can, can totally change it, something that starts no, no larger than a small cloud, you know, yes. comes in and moves into it from the periphery, can move in and, and exactly. totally ch build up a critical mass and change that system. And we know that there was like a bifurcation point right after Crete that it, it switched. So I'd like you to address a little bit about that because well, I was very hopeful the idea that it can change. We feel so weighed down by the monolith of the last 5,000 years. Well, it did change once. The yes. fact that we had this shift once in our prehistory and that we can really now, UCLA archaeologist Maria Gimbutas, of course, has yeah. really thoroughly documented how this came about and we don't have time, you know, to yeah. go into it, but it was from the periphery. I mean, in the heartlands where the, earth, where the earth was indeed a good mother to us, we developed this less tense, this more happy, comfortable partnership way based on equal partnership between women and men and the honoring of the so-called feminine, yes. uh, caring, compassion, nonviolence. And again, it was not ideal, but then came the shift. And this is really so fascinating because today at the very leading edge of science are scientists like Ilya Prigozhin who are writing about chaos theory, who are writing about systems disequilibrium being the times when you can really get fundamental systems change from what they call a very beginning with a slight perturbance. <laughs> now, we could think of the modern movements, the ecology movement, the international peace movement, the international women's movement, the human rights. Human rights, sure. The movements for social and political and racial and economic justice. Mm. We've been taught to think of them as disparate movements. But if exactly. we really look at it in terms of this conceptual framework, we see that they're not. That they're all part of this mounting resurgence of the partnership thrust. And today it is a thrust for survival. Exactly. And so there is a very real possibility of another systems shift. But it's not going to just happen by itself. It's only going to happen if we really make it happen. And the artist's role, the yes. role of the artist in helping us to begin through new images, through new stories, to image this different reality, this partnership reality, that is an integral role. And it has really, uh, I, I think it's one of the most important things. And this is one of the things that the Center for Partnership Studies is really about, because this is a very important level of accelerating this shift from the to complete the shift, because look, it's already, I mean, today, for example, we recognize, uh, you know, so many things that used to be taken for granted, like, you know, used to be rape, you know, relax and enjoy it. Today we see it <laughs> as, a, as a form of male terrorism exactly. against women to maintain male dominance and the shelters for battered women. Again, it's a recognition that this was an institutionalization of the dominator system of keeping women down. So a lot is already happening, but we need the new conceptual framework, and we need the new stories, and we need the new images, and so that we can release our own creativity so we can co-create our own future. Yes, I think that's really interesting, too, because it's really with the women's movement that attacked this at the roots, that's yes. saying that it's domination, yes. that really named it, and saying that, you know, that it's this domination of half, this, half of the human race over the other, and that it's from that basic model that all of it you know, ex exceeds out. So it's almost like the survival thrust, like you say, for these, these movements to be emerging now. And I almost think of um, this, this current dominator system that we're under as this old dying dinosaur that's just so mean-spirited that it's <laughs> going to take all of us down with it if, when it goes. Well, that's you know? the danger. You see that yeah. in its death throes. Because, exactly. you know, the chalice and the blade ends with two future scenarios. Exactly. And one is breakdown of evolution and the other one is breakthrough. Exactly. And again, the recognition that, that you are expressing that this is not accidental, that these things are surfacing right now. I think it's very, very important that we be active participants, though, in these movements. And, and if you were going to sum up, really, one of my central findings from these, you know, over a decade of research, it's something that once you see it, it's very obvious, which is that the way a society structures the most fundamental of all relations, which is the relations between the female and male half of humanity, that's what women and men are, that that doesn't just affect our personal lives, you know, as we all know, as yes. women and men, but that it profoundly impacts everything about a society, whether it's peaceful or warlike, whether it honors the so-called feminine, or whether, you know, these conquest uh, dominator values are really in social guidance, uh, whether we have what we today call an ecological consciousness. I mean, these ancient people really had what we today call an ecological consciousness, except for them it was just the way it is. You know, of course, you know, the goddess. 
I exactly, and we think we're so sophisticated, you know, but we're just disconnected. That's what we are. So well, we're and reconnecting. Yes, this is just the reconnection. And also, it's clear that the values of this culture cannot solve these problems. It just simply it just cannot. And, and so we need something else. And that's why to keep putting more of it, I mean, reason isn't going to get us out of this mess. Well, really, it's irrational the way Well, the whole it mess runs. is irrational. Yes. And you cannot, what I always look at it is this way, you cannot just graft on peace and justice and ecological consciousness to a system that is fundamentally imbalanced, Im imbalanced in the most fundamental way, beginning yes. with, with the mo <laughs> most fundamental imbalance in the relations be between the two halves of humanity and in the value system is so skewed that you just, you know, I mean, you have to transform the system. So what's happening today, it's very distressing in some ways because change is only possible when there's a lot of shakeup, exactly. when there's a lot of really disequilibrium of the old things. That's the bad news. But the good news is that this is a transition time. That we might survive. How's that, that for good news? That we might survive. In, in the minute or two that we have left, I just wanted to say some of the things that you were doing that if my audience is interested, uh, there will be a number at the end of the show because Rianne is, as I said, the co-director of the Center for Partnership Studies. And this is a grassroots movement that's springing up all over the country. And, and I know you have a lot of things coming up. One thing that we're all eager for is your new books that are coming out. I know you're working well, on some sequels. The Partnership Way is the first yes. thing that's coming out, and it's a a study and discussion guide to use with the chalice and the blade, uh, which I'm working on with my partner, with my husband, with David Loy. And it's really meant for a lot of groups, churches, community groups, colleges, and it's going to be fun using it. Another thing I'd like to tell you about is the festival in San Francisco in March at the Galleria Center, which is called Gaia Reborn, Healing the Earth, which is a benefit for the Center for Partnership Studies, which is going to be quite something. I mean, I'm going. It's going to I would be miss absolutely it for anything. marvelous. We yes. have the most marvelous artists in it, and of course, also the whole grassroots movement is the most exciting thing. I mean, supporting Partnership Los Angeles, Partnership Chicago, you know, affiliated groups that are really working because it is we who. I mean, the partnership model is not a guru model. Exactly. It's not somebody who's going to come and give it to you in handy tablet form, you know. It's, and, yes, yeah, right. it, it's it is. linking, it's connecting. It is what we are building out of our new recreation and reconstruction by reconnecting with our ancient roots, but not to go back to any good old days, but to really go forward and to using the best in technology and the best in everything in us into a new future of partnership. Well, I, I thank you, and I know others thank you for your message of hope and your brilliant scholarship, Rihanna. and thank you for being thank here. Thank you. It's been wonderful to talk okay. with you, Stuart. All right, and thank you for watching, and good night.